Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Today's the 17th of September, 2017. It's a question and answer session, so let's dive into the questions. First question is from Dan. Hi, Curtis. I'm looking to pick up my first loft system we will be used almost exclusively in my woodworking and metalworking shop for recording demonstration-style videos. As you might expect, it's a hostile environment for recording sound in. It's full of hard reflective services and machines producing a range of noises across the audible frequency range. While researching my options, I came across a few instances of people suggesting cardioid and hypercardioid lobs to do a better job in loud environments than omnidirectional ones. In your experience, have you found this to be true? And if so, how significant is the improvement? Um, yeah, Dan, that's definitely a good point. I would say that that can be true. There are a few options to consider here. Uh, let me just pull you uh, pull up one here. Countryman makes a cardioid. This is actually an ear set or a head-worn microphone that hooks on your ear. Um, this has two advantages. Number one, it does have a very uh, a much more directional pickup pattern, a cardioid pickup pattern, but it also puts it fairly really close to your mouth. So not only are you getting the benefits of a stronger uh, signal-to-noise ratio because you have it so close to the person's mouth, your mouth, um, but you also have a cardioid polar pattern, so that helps as well. Um, that would probably be the ideal in that type of situation, and I think, yes, that's very much a, a good idea if you're okay with having that on your face during the video. So I would say in that case, it's probably worth it. The, you're right. That is a, an environment that's so hostile to sound that I would say that's probably one of the better choices. I have not had great luck with cardioids that are worn, say, clipped to somebody's shirt. Um, if they kind of get tugged and they kind of turn sideways, things get all messed up. Um, and they just don't generally sound all that great in my experience. Um, but I think this would be a better option for a hostile sound environment, as you call it there. And uh, hopefully that's helpful for you. There are others on the market as well, I'm sure. Um, but that's one I'm familiar with and have tried before. All right. Thanks for that one, Dan. Next up is from Rena. Hi, Curtis. What would be the best microphone to record sound with a smartphone, Android or iPhone? Um, that is mic recording into the phone. She wants good sound quality and attached to the phone with the possibility to change its angle in relation to the filmed person or object. Uh, there are a couple questions I have for you, Rena. I, I, I'm going to take my best shot at answering this, but these are the questions I would ask. Are you also filming with the phone? If so, that cause that's going to make a difference. Uh, and number two, how uh, are, are you set on? It sounds like you're set on uh, the equivalent of a shotgun microphone for your phone. Um, or are you also open to lavalier microphones? Because a uh, lavalier microphone in this case might actually be a better choice, depending on what you're doing. I don't know. If it's just walk-up interviews and you don't have time to connect a lavalier to someone, I guess that makes sense as well. Let me just um, share with you one of my thoughts. Rode makes the video micro which is essentially like a miniature shotgun microphone. It's actually made for going on cameras, so its output does need to be adapted to work with phones, but it does sound pretty good. Uh, you do have to find a way to mount it to your phone is the problem if you are intending to mount it to the phone. However, you don't have to do that. It doesn't have to be mounted to the phone. You could, in, you could in fact, put this on a short boom, and um, that would work nicely. It does have a cold shoe mount, so you have to whatever you're going to use to adapt it to fit on your phone we'll need to have a cold shoe or something like it. The other thing you'll need along with that is this adapter here, the Rode SC4, which will adapt it from TRS to TRRS to get it into your phone. So those are some of the thoughts there. There are a whole plethora of lavalier microphones available there. If you go over to my other channel, Curtis Judd, as opposed to Curtis Judd Audio, um, we do have some recent videos and I'll put a link to one of those where we compare a whole bunch of lovelier microphones that work with phones. I think off the top of my head, probably my favorite is, um, on the cheap end at least, is the Aperture ALOV. Um, it sounds pretty good, and it does have a relatively long cable, so you can connect it to the phone and still have people at a comfortable working distance from the phone, especially if you're using a telephoto lens attached to your camera or to your phone. Um, so that's one to consider as well. All right. So thanks, Rena, for that question. If I if I misunderstood what you're trying to do, go ahead and write back with some additional details, and I'd be happy to take another um, shot at that. Next up from Roman. Hi, Curtis. Thank you for the great course. I'm not a sound guy or filmmaker, but I'm helping my wife with her cinematography course at the New York Film Academy. They learned a lot about video production, but very little about sound. Surprise! <laughs> Even film schools don't necessarily focus a lot on sound. I found your course very useful, especially for someone who'd never had any experience with sound editing and mixing. I have a question about Isotope RX workflow. And he lists several of the steps here 
um, that I've demonstrated before uh, in previous videos for sound, or sound for video sessions. So um, there are a whole bunch of those that I'll actually refer you back to some of them that may be helpful for you, Roman. Um, essentially, you're asking for what's the step-by-step -step guide for RX. And then you cite a couple of different things. So first of all, there's a module chain tool, which is really nice to help you kind of set up um, a chain of different effects so that you can go back to those. When you bring in a new piece of audio, you can just pull that back up again and apply a whole chain of effects to process and clean the audio. So that's that's definitely a nice thing. Um, and you're asking kind of what are the, the, the what what are the most useful tools to create a universal preset? I will be honest, I never used universal presets. I don't, I, the only thing I do, in fact, if I show you here, um, we're gonna come back to that, is within the individual plugins, I will create um, some presets here. And really they're very simple. Like here, for example, I use, I've been using Nectar uh, a lot to do my compression and DSing. And so I just have, what I did is I just pretty much set kind of a default set of, se of uh, settings on each of these and saved it as a preset. And I still have to tweak it. Every single time I have to come in and change the threshold, I may tweak the uh, ratio. So I may bump that up to four, I may leave it at three, I may drop it to two, depending on the audio, how much um, compression I need to do. Um, almost always I leave the attack at zero and the release at 250 for dialogue for most people. And then over here in the DSer, it's a single control. So I'll just come in here and tweak this, but I just really have kind of the general setup. And then when I'm ready to do my de-breathing, that is when someone talks and then they take a breath in between phrases, I wanna kind of clean some of that up. Um, and here, here I have kind of the default go-to for a pl application after I've done my loudness normalization. So I find that in most cases, I, again, I have to tweak this sometimes too, but the sensitivity I set at about 75%, and then I adjust the gain to um, identify how much attenuation of the breaths I wanna do. So that's really my workflow. I don't generally use this module chain up here, although some people like to work that way. It's a personal preference. The problem I see is this. With D-Click, for example, you can't just run a D-Click across an entire 15 minute clip of audio and expect it to just get the clicks, it doesn't work that way. You have to generally, at least in my experience, you generally have to find the clicks, highlight them, and then apply this. So that's not a great um, option for the module chain necessarily. Um, in terms of denoising, I know you mentioned that you use the spectral denoise. I typically don't use that for dialogue. For dialogue, I'll almost always use the voice denoise. Um, and this is a pretty straightforward one. You could, again, this is one where I like to do multiple passes, but I want to hear it before I apply another pass. So again, that's not one that I usually put in a chain. One, maybe some good candidates for putting in a chain would be if you are going to apply, for example, a high pass filter in every single audio clip, that would make sense to put in a module chain up front here. Um, and with some pretty conservative settings that you could come back in and tweak it further. I think really what it comes down to is it depends on how much, if you're working with really, it depends on how much you want to automate versus fine tune. Because if you're gonna automate, yeah, module chain is a great thing to use. If you're really trying to dial in or really clean up some audio that's really bad, I don't find that module chains are a great idea because you can't fine tune them as well. You, you still end up having to jump into each individual plugin to get the right settings for that particular piece of audio. So there are some thoughts there. Um, let's just come back here. He had You had some more questions as well. You found that the spectral denoise is a much better tool for cleaning very noisy sound, but still there's no magic. I agree, there is no magic. The spectral denoise is a little bit more fiddly. There are a lot of settings to tweak. And in fact, you show your settings here for those that aren't familiar with it. You have a whole bunch of control on different things here. You can set a threshold. Um, you, <laughs> you have different settings for noisy and tonal. And to be honest, I don't entirely understand exactly how these work. I haven't jumped into this one a whole lot, but there's also some, some things to do with noise floor. You can actually synthesize some noise floor. This one's actually good. I found this plugin most useful if you're, um, if you have some, uh, if you need to generate some room tone to kind of create a transition from one clip of audio to another. This is actually, a, can be a fairly useful plugin for that. Um, there's some set it, you know, you can change the algorithm, you can choose the smoothing, you can actually output the noise only, which is helpful when you're trying to dial in the settings to make sure that this is this, it's playing back the stuff that you're going to get rid of, which is useful. So you can make sure you're not cutting into the dialogue too much. Um, this is, a, again, this is the kind of the, 
This is kind of a, a little bit more than I would normally use for dialogue unless it's extraordinarily noisy and you need to do some kind of hardcore surgery surgery to clean it up. Um, so I, and then you ask, what's the final stage of an isotope RX? Well, usually the last thing I do is either the debreathing or maybe a final EQ. Um, but I keep the loudness normalization near the end. So you don't want to go tweaking with things too much after you've done the loudness normalization, because then you're going to have to loudness normalize again. So, um, to be honest, uh, and then you also offer to send a sample project. If you would not mind, I would love to have you send over a sample clip, um, and I would be happy to demonstrate that in a future episode of uh, Sound for Video Sessions. But to be honest, essentially, it sounds like you're asking for a course on RX, <laughs> and maybe that's a good idea. Maybe that's something we could consider doing at some point. There are a lot of things to consider, but there's no magic, um, as you mentioned. It's a matter of getting in and, and figuring out, using your ears, which of these plugins is going to help dial the sound of my, my particular piece in. So... Um, I hope that's helpful. Go ahead. Again, if you would like to send over a clip, I'd be happy to use that as a demonstration on a future episode. And then our final question is from George. First of all, he says, first of all, I want to thank you for the YouTube videos online course. They've been really instrumental in helping me to learn location sound and pick out the gear I needed. My question is in regards to the Mix Pre 3. How do I know what volume to set my headphones relative to the input game? Am I to rely mostly on the visual meters for the gain control? Or is there some way to strike a balance between the headphone gain and and the channel gain in order to monitor at the level my recorder is recording at. Hope that makes sense. Thanks again, George. It does indeed make sense, I think, George. I think what um, I think what it really comes down to is, yes, you do need to use both. The volume control on your headphones is just to get you to a comfortable level so that you can monitor, so you can hear what's going on. There is no calibration or magic thing you need to do in terms of setting the headphone volume relative to your input gain. That's that's not really how it works. So what I'm listening for when I'm using my headphones to monitor is I'm listening for potential problems. So what I can, and how that relates to setting your input gain, um, you're listening for clipping. If it's starting to clip or if the limiters are starting to, to kick in really hard and start pumping, then you know you've got a problem and your gain probably needs to come down. But you can't, by listening alone, figure out what your input gain has to be. I think you really do need to rely on the visual meters to understand whether, you know, where you're sitting in terms of where your pe peaks are hitting um, and where you need to get your, your gain level set. So I hope that makes sense. So I really see the monitoring of the headphones as setting the volume to a comfortable level where you can hear everything you need to hear. And then as far as setting gain, input gain, that's really a matter of changing the gain level and looking at the meters. And <clears throat> in addition to that, listening with your ears for any problems with the gain. So uh, you can't judge, uh, I can't judge the levels overall without looking at the meters just by listening on the headphones until it gets to be super problematic and you start either clipping or, you know, really pressing hard into those um, limiters. So I hope that makes sense. Those are the kind of the two things I look for. So again, overall volume level on the headphones is what's comfortable for you to hear whether or not there are problems. And then you use the meters and what you're hearing to make decisions on where your gain should be set. All right, those were the questions for this week. I hope that was helpful. Um, if I misunderstood any questions, that happens all the time. If I just don't have enough context, for example, to understand what you're asking, or I just, my brain is slow that day <laughs> when I answered go ahead and, and contact me back. I would love to, to kind of hear more information and we're happy to take another look in cases where that makes sense. Go out there and make some great recordings. We'll talk to you again next week.